Hello, my name is Frank Monaghan, and in this podcast I'm going to be looking at the language and other semiotic resources that were used by a group of protesters during a demonstration held outside the Home Office in March 2017 as part of the All Grief Truth and Justice campaign. And it was held there because the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, had decided to deny an inquiry into the events that become known as the Battle of Orgreave that took place in June 1984 as part of the miners' strike of that year. And so it was called making some noise in response to the what the protesters saw as the silencing of that group by the Home Secretary. Over recent years, Applied linguists have become increasingly interested in the role that places play in the shaping of language and indeed that language plays in the shaping of our understanding of places. Think about, for example, the use of language in Tahrir Square as part of the Arab Spring or in uh, Madrid as part of the demonstrations there and Occupy Wall Street. And so it's important for us to consider how spaces and places are meeting points of particular uh, trajectories of different opinions and of how we find things are contested through them. And as Doreen Massey says here, that they're meeting places for stories so far and how identities get created within them. Alistair Pennycook, in this quotation here, points out that language is a local practice, as he calls it. So the way we use it in a particular place tells us something about how we see that place. So when demonstrators choose to go outside the Home Office, they are telling a particular story about what they think that building is for. And in this case, of course, they're staking a claim to their rights to hold an inquiry. Uh, Whereas the Home Office, of course, stands there as an institution of the state. So these contested identities, these different stories, emerge in the kind of language practices that we can see taking shape there. As you might expect, the language used by protesters outside the Home Office is very different from the language used by people from within the Home Office. And we can see in this quote from Bakhti that this in some ways reflects the different power structures that exist in society. So as he points out here that the voice of authority will often be that of intimidation and of violence and cold reason. So for those who are outside of that, they have to find other ways. And so laughter, comedy, song, making noise are often resources that get deployed in these sorts of contexts. A very visible feature on demonstrations are the banners and placards that protesters carry with them. And yet often the language used on them is overlooked. So for the rest of this podcast, I'm going to explore some of the linguistic creativity evident in these different signs and look at them both from a formal point of view, but also as narratives. This sign, Coal Not Dole, first appeared during the miners' strike of 1984 to 1985 and has persisted since, and its use of rhyme foregrounds the message that's there. But we should also note the use of colour. The black on yellow makes it a highly visible sign, but also the splash of red, presumably to signify blood spilt by the police during the miners' uh, strike in the Battle of Orgreave. It also exists as a form of parallelism. You can see here down on the left that it it almost forms a sort of colour rhyme with the Hillsborough Justice Campaign, also using this yellow and black and uh, red. The foregrounding is also reflected in the slogan, two struggles, one fight. So we have a parallelism there at the lexical level, two, one, use of numbers but also the grammatical level of the plural struggles becoming the singular one fight. The sign exists in other formats, as on this flag here, and what's interesting to note is how social media has impacted on these banners and placards. So you can see the link to the Facebook site and also to the website of the campaign. So this is how the offline world connects back into the online world. See other examples of this foregrounding technique in some of the placards that were on the demonstration. So here, for example, never forget, never forgive. We have a parallelism, the use of the same word twice. Again, that's reflected in the other placard, no justice, no peace. And we also have the use of alliteration and the forget and forgive, and the never, never, and the going across the signs, the no and no, so the use of the N. And again, the use of colour, giving a certain balance to it, so topped and tailed, 
uh, with the words solidarity, unity. So those two are also brought into connection with one another through the use of colour. And they are linked then with the inquiry demanded on the other banner. The concept of double voicing comes from Michal Bakhtin. And in this quote from Ronald Carter, we can see how it is used by people in a sort of parodic way. And this goes back to the earlier quotation from Bakhtin about how the powerless often will use humour because they're denied voices in other ways. They're denied the legitimate voice of authority. And so that's reflected also in these demonstrations if we look at this poster here, which is a parody of a familiar uh, sort of crime stopper placard produced by the police. Again, we can see the use of these parallelisms of beaten up, fitted up, locked up, so the lexical and grammatical repetitions there, as well as the formal features of the use of the blue colouring for the police and of the uh, checked tick tape that was used in these sorts of posters. Norman Fairclough, the critical discourse analyst, talks about forms of transgression and crossing boundaries. And so this poster is a good example of this as to how a conventional crime stopper type poster is then subverted by groups that has been characterised as criminal in order to turn the tables and to put the police in the role of the criminal. So this recontextualization of the Crime Stopper ad is a good example of how authority and power can be challenged in this way, particularly through the use of multimodal resources. Multimodality, of course, is a very striking feature of the large banners that are carried through the streets on demonstrations. And banners have long been used in order to be able to tell a story above the noise of the demonstration itself, in order to get messages across. And this happens particularly well visually, pictorially. So this banner, for example, is from the North Selby branch, and it has particular mini stories, mini narratives contained within it. So in this detail from the banner, for example, we see Margaret Thatcher and uh, the often repeated claim that the miners' strike was actually being used by the Tories in order to break up the power of the National Union of Miners. And in this detail, we can see the police horses in combination with the lawyer and the papers he's carrying as part of a broader campaign of the anti-trade union legislation that was being passed during this period by the government. And in this detail we can see a mock-up of the Sun newspaper which carried a story at the time that Arthur Scargill, who was the leader of the miners' union, was claiming that this was part of a policy to close down the pits in the country and this was denied, that this was a deliberate strategy and of course in historical hindsight that is exactly uh, what did happen shortly after the uh, miners' strike ended. And this is reflected in a detail on another banner showing the sacked miners on the scroll and the UB40, which was the unemployment benefit that miners received uh, once they were made redundant. So in combination then, this tells a mini narrative of what was happening and of how the story is being put together as a tale of how politicians, the legal system, the police force, the media are uh, combined in an attack on the uh, National Union of Mine Workers. And this is the perspective that's pro projected through these banners. And the banners are used to provide a counter-narrative to that particular history that was uh, told otherwise by the more powerful groups. The banners then are a good illustration of the point made here by Jan Chari, Hulera and Meyer that multimodality has its links to the power structures in society about who is empowered to speak and what modes that are given to speak in. And so this grabbing of the visual text, the claiming of space outside the normal boundaries, are ways that the power less have of contesting the power full. In conclusion then, when considering the politics of language and creativity, it's important to think about the role that space and places play in that. And as Alistair Pennycook argues here, we often think of these places as being inert and fixed. 
Whereas what we need to see is that it is a constantly changing, dynamic and emergent environment, a context that is recontextualized, that is entextualized through the use of language and other semiotic resources by people carving out identities and struggling for different positions within the political sphere. It is a space where we can make some noise and hopefully make a difference.